first of all, I am already really excited because this is, this is probably the biggest in my tenure here, biggest stretch of parenting age group that I've ever had in one place before. Um, so that's really neat. And that was actually one of the secret reasons that I really wanted to do this is so we could all get together um, and just right off the bat lay it out there that we're part of a body of Christ and we are all in this together. And, that's very, and, and so all of us in here, it's not... I've got youth group parents here, and I've got rock kid parents here, and GSK parents here, and I've got people that are, well, my kids are still really young, and then, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. What I wanted to do was get everybody together simply so we can all be in a room together, we can talk about some things that are going on. Some of my parents in here that are more seasoned can speak some wisdom to some of the younger parents, and... Um, one of the things that I'd love to see this expand into is there are parent small groups. I'm not looking at making a parent small group, but maybe bi-yearly, twice a year doing something like this. And we can expand it a little bit more, add a, you know, add a meal dynamic to it and everything. But just where all the parents of Gateway are getting together and spending time talking to one another. Um, I think that this is vastly, vastly important. And one of the big reasons I think it is important is because I know that I cannot do my job as a parent by myself. I need you guys. I, I, I do. Um, so uh, so that's, that's kind of the whole point behind this. Now, a lot of you have probably been really curious, why are we calling it R-rated parenting? What's going to happen? Here's why I wanted to do it, because throwing it out there, we are going to talk about sex and pornography tonight. So that's why I wanted to do that. And I wanted to do it in an environment where I did not have to filter myself. Now, most of you that know me very well are like, when do you do that anyway? Um, I don't. Now, there are some faces in here that I don't recognize, and there are some faces of some younger parents in here that I have not interacted with very closely. I am irreverent and crass. I'm just saying that, just right off, because I, I just want to get right to the point. But no matter how irreverent and crass I am, I will never be as bad as Jeremy. Um, so no matter what I do, Jeremy will cross the line the next time. Um, but that's what, I wanted to have a safe space where we could talk about real things, not in code, and we could uh, uh, talk about some things that are going on that I have observed. I have spent... Um, many, many years as a juvenile probation officer, coupled with many, many years as a youth minister, and I've made I've, over a decade of just kind of observations, and I finally, I was, I've been sitting down with Jeremy, we've been talking about this for months, and I said, I just want to share some of my observations that I'm seeing happening, because while you guys have infinitely more knowledge than me, you, probably, you are raising better kids than I am, I am not trying to speak as an authority, I am speaking from an observational standpoint of having dealt with so many kids over so many years for a period of time, and some of the trends that I'm seeing. Um, because, this might come as a surprise to you, but your kids act different when they're not around you. Now sometimes that's good. Like in my case, that's good. My kids are apparently angels when they go hang out with people like Marcy and Brenda. At the house, not so much. Um, but I want to segue that part into it and say this. Anytime you do a parenting get-together, a parenting class, a parenting discussion, anytime you do anything like that, um, you run the risk of people sitting there and saying, don't, don't tell me how to raise my kid. Don't. Don't tell me that this is... That, no, no. First of all, Seth, I've seen your kids. They're crazy. You, you, you've, got, you've got no leg to stand on. And secondly, your kids aren't even teenagers. What do you know? So I want to nip that part in the bud and say, everything I present tonight is an observation for you to take and do with what you want. Is that, is that fair? Now, it may come across that I am getting on to some of y'all, and at some point... If you are not uncomfortable in this class when I talk about some of the things that I've seen and read and encountered, then I have not done a great job. I want you to be a little uncomfortable. I want you to be a little bit challenged. I want to take some of the things that you know you do and you probably... And I mean, all of us have that thing, I know I do this as a parent, but I, I really shouldn't, but I do it anyway. I, I have those things too. Um, but so I just want to get that out of the way right, off the, right at the top. 
that I am not, this is not a parenting class as far as it being a how-to situation. Um, this is a, hey, here's some observations that I'm making based on the way culture is happening. Um, if I was to call it something different than R-rated parenting, I would call it proactive parenting. We, you should be proactive anyway, but we are at a time and place in our culture where proactivity in the raising of our children is now more important than I think it's ever been. Not reactive parenting, but proactive parenting. One, because of the sheer influx of information that is coming to them at such a young age. And two, and it's because of these things. It's because of these things. We have to be proactive parents, which means that we're going to lay some things out that you guys are probably going to be like, yeah, I knew all this, I knew all this. Well, my, my challenge is, okay, so if you know this, how are you going to parent your kid through it? How are you going to walk with them through it? Um, so we're going to go over some stats, the way that this is affecting our kids' brains in ways that you might not even know as far as their development. And then we're going to talk about how that's affecting their relationships. I am going to make some observations from our own youth group that are going to make you uncomfortable because you're going to be like, is he talking about my kid? The answer is yes, I'm talking about your kid. So there you go. Um, but I have made some observations with our teens in the last year that have been concerning from the standpoint, not so much a sin, not sin standpoint, but just in a standpoint of their ability to even put into words what their faith means to them, their ability to stay focused, their ability to just have a conversation. These are things that I'm really seeing are really diminishing in, in our teens and everything like that, and I think that there are some reasons behind that. Um, but I want this to be a conversation. So if you have something you want to say, shout it out, lift it up. There's some parents here that asked me to record this, so I'm recording it. This will pick you up. So if you start talking and I start walking close to you, that's because I want to pick it up. Um, Andy Stanley, uh, we were at Catalyst, and Andy Stanley said something at the very beginning that just, I know that it rocked me, it rocked Jeremy, it rocked Jessica and Jen and Ryan and Ashley were there. Um, his son introduced him. His son is doing stand-up comedy and his his son introduced him, and uh, so Andy came out, and you could just feel how excited he was. You could, you could just see that he just kind of had that, that hum of, you know, this is what my son is doing, and it's really cool. But then he said this. He said, Jesus came to save us, not to parent your, your children. Jesus came to save us, not to parent your children. He tasked you with that job. You. And in the name of Jesus, he tasked you with that job which is huge to me. I, it just reverberated in my mind that one of the main things because of a choice that Jessica and I were so blessed to make it now in my life is raising two souls and wanting them to be kingdom people. Actually, three souls if you, if you count Zechariah. Um, that statement just kind of shook me a little bit uh, because all of a sudden... I realize that parenthood with your children is a microism of kingdom living. It is. I mean, think about it. The way you interact with your kids and everything like that, it's a microism of the way that you live your kingdom life. And the sad part about that is we're most, we're, we're, the bad parts of us normally come out more with our kids quicker. But think about it. You know, we get aggravated at people we work with. We get aggravated at our kids. You know, we love the people that we're friends with. We love our kids unconditionally. You know, there are all these emotions and sensations that you have when you're raising your kids, when you're, when you're, when you're able to do that. And I think that you are living right into the purpose that God created you because you, you have kids. Now, I want to make this very clear for those that, um, you know, that have chosen not to have kids. They still have absolute purpose. So this is not a... This is not a, uh, uh, an if-or situation. It's a both-and situation. Um, but that statement just kind of has rattled with me. So, uh, and even if you didn't say anything, I mean, I know that you thought something. What you're hearing right now, especially in a lot of these, this is, this is the body of Christ at work. I wanted us to get together. I mean, I feel like we could do this all night, just sharing some of these concerns and then having opportunities to speak into them. All of us, there were several things said that I'm going to hit on a little bit, and there are several things that we all relate to, and then there are several things that were said that we all know is coming, you know, in the future. Uh, that's why it's vastly important for us as family members here at Gateway to expand the relationships that we have in this room. The youth ministry and the student ministry, I'm going to ask this question next. We won't allow for that. The, 
it's not about a job. It's not about finding ways to entertain your kids so they'll like church and, you know, you hire the right guy that presents an environment that's fun for them. You guys have known me long enough to know that that's not what I'm about. But that's the student ministry is what we have right now. It's everybody in this entire church that has a child is part of this ministry together, this body of Christ. And we have to be able to be open with each other about these concerns and talk about these concerns and work on these concerns. So I am going to direct it back to church, though, with this next question before, again, we, we really kind of talk a little bit, I get into it. Is, all right, so what do you, and the concerns that you have, even if you said them or not, um, as it pertains to what you're talking about, what, are some, what do you think is the youth ministry's role in that? What is the church, the model that we have? Now, I'm not talking about necessarily the body of Christ as far as what is Jesus' role in that? Because, I mean, we, we've got, I'm talking about in the model. That That's at least the fourth or fifth time somebody has said something very similar to what the word would be as empathy. And we're going to talk about that at length because one of the things that, believe it or not, psychologically, the use of the way that we are communicating on cell phones is depleting in our teens is empathy. Um, Sherry Turkle uh, She's worked at MIT for, for 30 plus years, and what she started 20 plus years ago is she started um, researching the effects of technology on brain development. And because of the development part of that, she really hyper-focused on teenagers. Now, there's a lot in here about um, just adults in general. She has no problem now. It is not faith-based, but the issues and the solutions that she has to the... To, to what we're dealing with, it's just God's fingers are all in it. I mean, it's, it's very much, uh, in fact, the, the, the ending of the story is silence, solitude, and communion, table. Those are the things that are going to fix the, the, the psychological developmental problems that we are creating in our children. Um, and I just find that fascinating that a non-Christian person reaches these conclusions and the study she had. Um, I, I've Alone Together is the first one, um, why we expect more from technology and less from each other. This one is an interesting one. I want to give you a quick rundown. Now, I think you should read them all. If you're, like, if you're looking at both of them right now and you're like, no, um, read Reclaiming Conversations before Alone Together. This is definitely, read this one. In fact, Rachel said she finished the first chapter and she messaged me about how good it was. I, I mean, it is, it is powerful, powerful stuff. Um, I actually bought three or four of them and they've already been dispersed out amongst the... Uh, Yeah, I hear that. For a dollar, you can go and get this on Amazon Prime. So it's very, very, very good. Now, she did something interesting in this one. The first time I read it, it was really weird. She starts it out like the whole first half of the book. She's talking about how this movement about people that were not, not in a sexual way, but were really engaging in, um, they were really trying to work on uh, artificial intelligence as far as friendships and everything. A lot of that work was being done overseas. And then talking about various Internet phenomenon that like Second Life and things like that, which are, are things where you can basically, they were all precursors to Facebook and all this, where you can create a fake person that is your avatar, and that's who you are. And I remember being like, I mean, this is good information, but this doesn't really apply to what I'm trying to do. And then you get into Section 2. That is called... Uh, tethered. And in section two, that's when she starts interviewing teenagers. And when she starts interviewing teenagers, you start to realize that what we have essentially done is we're all cyborgs now. We're all a non-entity to someone that is texting us. We are sterilizing our communication and our relationships with each other. And so it was really brilliant the way she twisted it. And because I was like, I ain't never going to want to talk to a robot and have a conversation. And then I was like, I've had teens who are like, hey, I really need to talk with you. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, can I text you about it later? <laughs> they want to sterilize the conversation because they don't want tears. They don't want mess. They want to be able to control exactly what they want to say. They want to make the conversation, for all extensive purposes, robotic. That's what they want to do. Now, we're kind of like that, too. I have found myself, I am infinitely more comfortable sending an email or a text message, especially if there's some tension. You know, especially if there's some tension. I have found, she says this in Reclaiming Conversation, it's great. She's like, we don't even apologize really anymore. An apology has this feeling of penitent remorse, and you look in someone's eyes and you say, I'm sorry, and you watch the emotions that play over their face. 
when you send an I'm sorry on text message, she's interviewed, and she talks to thousands of teens. They say, no, what I'm sorry has turned is, into is, hey, can we stop being tense around each other? Can we just go to being okay again? And they don't even know how to fully realize either a disagreement or something like that. So it was really, it was really rather brilliant the way that she, uh, she, she entered into the information. Now, I've got to tell you guys something. I read this book coming into youth ministry. And so I ask these questions to our teens. I normally, when we go to the fall retreat, I put the juniors, I put the luggage in the gold van and I keep one seat in there and I let the seniors and the juniors and seniors normally ride with me. And we ride up there, we don't listen to the radio, we don't have our phones out, and I ask them questions. And I am telling you right now, I was creeped out that they answer exactly like these teens do. And it just was like, wow, this is really what they're going through. They feel tethered. There is no breaks in their life. They are constantly connected. It is alone together. We are more connected than any generation of people ever, yet we are the loneliest generation ever. We are the most depressed generation. Yes? So I was on an airplane this last week um, with a girl who was coming to Pensacola for the Navy. She was 18 years old, and there were three, I think, people she said that dropped out of boot camp because they couldn't take the time away from their phone. It was two months. They couldn't take it. It was They were depressed. They, they quit. Yeah. And uh, I guess the, you know whoever their superiors are tried to talk to them. This is very temporary. You get it back when you're finished. It's, it's, it's a full-fledged addiction. It triggers a part of your brain that is an addiction, and it also triggers a part of your brain where it becomes actually an appendage. And when they don't have it with them, they sometimes think that they can feel when they're getting text messages like a ghost arm. If you were to have your arm removed or something like that, they say sometimes you still feel that sensation in your brain. That's how tethered, and I say they, but y'all know I'm talking about y'all too. Um, we are tethered to these things, but what, what, here's what is starting to happen. So anyways, let me, let me finish explaining the books. And then she, so she goes and she's interviewing these teens, and, and what she says, it's actually heartbreaking because she is a non-parent talking to these teens, and she is amazed at how stressed and anxious they are. And this is, this is, what, this is what she said. We are raising our children with normative symptoms born of fear, isolation, and abandonment. We are raising our children for them to think to, in fear, isolation, and abandonment because we are raising them in a place where if they don't answer a text message or if they send a text message and it is not answered, they immediately feel something is wrong, something is amiss. Now, for us as adults, you know, we have to deal with this for our teens their brains are mush, and they are developing. So they are now developing with these little seeds inside of their brain. Proactive parenting. It's already happened. It's already happening. So this isn't a discussion about, well, we've got to get rid of phones. Revolution at Gateway. We're going to throw them out. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So what do we have to do? We have to change the paradigm. We have to change the method in which we are now approaching this and be proactive. Phones exist. How do we apparent around that? How do we raise our kids? The same, all the concerns that you had, how do we raise our kids to develop without having some of these things? So she does this, but what she doesn't do in this is offer any solutions. She just like drops the bomb in the room and runs out. Um, so she came out a few years back with this one, and this is Reclaiming Conversation, and here is where she does her solutions. This one is the one that you need to read. It needs to be on your bookshelf. She does TED Talks if you're like, I refuse to read it. Um, but I'm telling you, I was just reading over it, getting prepared to have some conversations with you guys, and it just rips to the heart of me. All right? We had this, converse, we had this conversation with Jack today. Boredom. It's healthy. Boredom is healthy because what boredom does is it teaches your kids to creatively activate their imagination to deal with the problem of boredom. So if we do not allow our children to be bored, we are hindering their psychological development. Again, observation. If we do not allow them to sit and have nothing to do in front of them and to figure it out with their own brain, it doesn't work. They are being developed with this very short attention span 
with this very uh, hesitant way of being able to, I mean, it, look, I, I, try, I don't want to throw my own kids under the bus, but like we dealt with this. I read that quote to Jack today because he was like, I'm so bored. And I'm like, look, man, I'm not going to give you a phone to play a game. I want you to think of something. I want you to engage. Use your imagination and color and do that sort of thing. Um, so boredom has this, 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 we're not allowing our children to just think and to exist and to engage creatively, and it is changing the way that their mind is working. So with this constantly tethered idea, they're starting, I don't know if you all know, but, but anxiety in teenagers is infinitely higher than it was with us. Anxiety is infinitely higher. They're more stressed. They are more tense. And all of this is because we are not teaching them how to Sabbath. We are not teaching them how to be silent. We are not teaching them how to disconnect. And here's the thing. They'll tell you. Silence is to the point now where it means you've gone into hiding and your friends won't know what your problem is. And they're dealing with that. They're dealing with that. Another way that the phone is affecting the way their brain is is their phone is not an interruption. The phone is another avenue in which they can now engage their attention. And so what it's doing is, is it's teaching them that it's okay to be engaged in conversation, but it's absolutely okay to fully disconnect from that to engage in this part. And so we're like, oh, well, that's okay because they're multitasking. Guess what? Multitasking is psychologically proven to where you do less quality work on all the things you're doing than if you focused on just one thing. But you know what happens when you multitask? little neurosensors in your brain start firing off that make you feel good, kind of like endorphins. And so it creates like a runner's high when you're doing seven things at a time because you're feeling like you're accomplishing them and you're doing it. And so you feel good about that. Am I allowed? Can I? No? Yes? No? All right, so um, Ron Swanson says it like this, okay? Ron Swanson says it like this, never half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. I'm sorry, and I actually, it's funny because I have that written in my book. <laughs> because that, but here's what I'm talking about. Here's how that's affecting our teens' brain. They, they are, they're not focusing, and they're constantly, uh, Greg's leaving on that one. I, I, I offended him. I didn't, I didn't think it'd be you, Greg. Uh, yeah. So what happens is, is they are living life with a foot over here and a foot over there, and they are not psychologically or biologically able to do that well. And yet we're developing them in that way. For the last five weeks, I've been conducting a social experiment with your teens in small group. I have been sitting with them trying to literally have in small group unfiltered conversation. And with all the love in my heart, your teens are almost incapable of doing that. I'm sorry. They struggle, and I give them softball. We start with movies, and we start with music, and then I try, and I try to get them to start talking about their faith, and they don't know how to talk about their faith. Now, y'all might be like, well, you're the youth minister. Teach them. I'm trying. I'm trying. But this is kind of one of those things, exactly what kept... This is a blurring of the lines of the way the world works and the way that church is supposed to be. It's a blurring of the lines in that they are engaging their time at the youth group just like they engage their time everywhere else. They're just as connected when they're there and their brains don't know how to handle it and it is developing them into this sort of thing. The other one is uh, it is creating a massive identity crisis. A massive identity crisis. Identity is, if I could, someone had asked me, as a youth minister, if you could snap your fingers and make one thing true about all of the teens that you work with, what would it be? And my answer is, is that I want them to see themselves in the mirror the way God sees them. That's, that would be my one wish. Social media, cell phones, and technology have stripped our teens of that. And what it has done, it has is, is created a world of validation with the face and the branding that they put out. Okay? So they can now brand themselves, and they will brand themselves to what gets them the most positive responses. So I printed off a study the other day as I was looking at this. Um, I'm going to try to move a little quicker. I printed off a study that when teens get likes, it triggers a part of their brain that is the exact same as winning something substantial amounts of money is actually what it specifically says. 
So the neurosensor that triggers in their brain when they see the amount of likes that they get on things that they present or the amount of response that they get, it actually triggers false happiness. And so what's happening is they are, again, their brains are mush. So what is their idea of happiness when their brain is fully developing? Well, it has to be how I am received with the personas that I present to people. Proactive parenting. This is happening across the board. This is happening with your teens. This is, again, and I, Kevin, I'm so glad you said that, and I'm going to keep referring to it. This is another place where we're blurring the lines. This is a place where their identity is supposed to be the most established, and yet it's just like everywhere else. It's all about being responded to positively, being validated. Now, y- y'all, aren't, y'all aren't immune to this one either. We're all like this. We all put forth a life that we hope makes other people jealous. We all put that out there. We want, and that's how we feel these false senses of happiness. But we're putting this on our teens. And we're, they are allowed to jump into these worlds. And so, well, and it's, 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 it's not an oddity. It's the psychological development that we're talking about right now. Um, uh, and what it's doing, all of this, and there's, oh, there's one quote here that I wanted to, uh, to read. Um, Afraid of being alone, we struggle to pay attention to ourselves. And what suffers is our ability to pay attention to each other. If we can't find our own center and our own identity, we lose confidence in what we have to offer others. And our teens are are struggling with this. So all of these things are related. And so then it comes to this. It comes to this idea of empathy. There's a study going around. Sherry, Sherry mentions a study that happened at this massive high school. And the number one issue that the teacher said is that children don't show empathy to one another. And they said they're not cruel, they're not bullying, but they just simply lack the emotional capacity to understand what empathy is, to see something through the eyes of one another. And so Sherry, in this book, what she has done is she has interviewed and specifically asked teens this question, and basically what it is, it's because everything I said at the beginning, we are sterilizing all of our conversations. We are stripping away the humanity of it. It's awkward if it's face-to-face. People don't want to see your tears. They don't want to see your mess. They want to see something that is sterile, that can be controlled, that they can think about, that they can process, that they can run it by some other people before they present it out. And what's happening is, is we are no longer able to connect on a deep emotional level. Now, this is another reason I wanted to have this, because I am seeing this and hearing this from my youth minister friends on an increasingly serious level. All right? A lot of you, all right, for those of us that were youth, in youth groups in the early 90s, y'all remember the snot and tears devos that we used to have? My goodness, the last night of camp, we were just, we were messes. All right? Now, that still exists to a degree with our group, but I want to tell you that those have substantially shifted. And at first I was like, well, man, maybe I'm not engaging them on a deep enough level. Well, then I started talking this past impact with a bunch of other youth ministers. I started specifically asking these questions, and they were like, yeah, we don't have devos like that anymore. Every once in a while you'll have a kid, but once a kid like, really engages on a deep level, like once a kid really engages, it actually makes the room so awkward nobody really knows what to do. So what? Well, they shut down because they're like, they walk over and they're like, hey, because they don't know how to empathize. They do not know how to engage. They do not know how to get into the mess of life that happens when it comes to face-to-face conversation and engaging without this. So this, I had said this before, this is interruption. Cause hey, no, 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 it's okay. It's all, in, it's all in good fun because all of you, no, it's not just her because I'm about to call a lot of you out. Do you know that your cell phone sitting on the table is a signal that you are not fully engaged and you will disconnect the second it lights up? You will. Teens, that's how it is. When the cell phone is out, even a silent cell phone is a symbol of, an, of, of, of a divided attention. It is. Now, here's where we start to meddle. Parents, this is where you mirror and they see this. This is where you do things and they see it and they know that if that table, if that phone is sitting on the table, even if it's on silent and it lights up because it gets a notification, they know that if you're even engaged, you're going to go. You're going to do that. She calls parents out for that. She calls them out. So again, if y'all are like, Seth, don't be calling me out for this. She's, the, the, the research shows that it, it, it destroys teens, and they remember it. The research shows that it is, becomes part 
of their development. So one of our concerns should be that we aren't ignoring our children for the expense of the things that are connecting us to other things. Um, and she asked these two questions in this book as part of this study. It's worth asking. Are we unintentionally depriving our children of tools they need at the very moment they need them? And are we depriving them of skills that are crucial to friendship, creativity, love, and work? Or are we just teaching them that it's okay to be divided in your attention, to multitask, to have all these things going, to constantly wonder what's going on, to just scroll your finger. When you're bored, you have something that you can immediately go to, and we are forgetting that we as adults, we think we are in control, but they're teenagers and their brains are developing wrapped around all of these little nuggets. And these are some of the issues that we are facing. It becomes dehumanizing in a way. It becomes dehumanizing in a way. Um, this is where you get into how easy it is to bully and cyberbully and how easy it is to have drama over text message. Our teens have drama with each other sometimes. It is never manifested face-to-face, -face, ever. It's always manifest. I'll walk in and they'll be sitting in a room and everything and then I'll hear later, yeah, they're really mad at each other. And I'm like, really? Like, and they're like, yeah, they were texting each other all night last night. And because it strips away the emotion because you know how much, you know, how much harder is it to fight with somebody when you're looking at them in the face and you're seeing those tears and you're seeing what your words are doing to them. And so that is what's happening is they're saying these kids aren't empathetic. They're not cruel yet. But of course, as we all know, yes, they are. Kids are, kids, we say this, kids are cruel. Kids are so mean. All right? And now, Jack and Kylie have come to me and said, yeah, this person said this to me before, but you know what? I'm not going to sit up here like I'm some white knight of a parent. My kids have said some things to some kids before, and I've just been like, what? Like, where did you even get that from? They've done that sort of thing. It becomes dehumanizing, and again, it becomes part of their developmental system. So that's why I keep saying this. It becomes part of who they are, and they lose the ability to empathize. And so here we are in the body of Christ talking about how the first fruit of the Spirit is love. We are supposed to be engaged with people, and our teens don't even know how to have eye-to-eye, -eye, meaningful, thick, good conversations. Um, she, you know, the way she talks about face-to-face uh, -face conversations and all the things that it teaches you, it teaches you to see the human in people. It teaches you to see the human in people. We've talked about this so much in the series, this, this, this uh, changing your colors, how the issue in so much of this and all of this is we dehumanize someone else. And the thing is, is we're kind of teaching our teens, as I, I'm, we're blurring the line saying we're all cyborgs now. We are dehumanizing them. All right, so now this, this segues into deeper issues and deeper things that are going on when it comes to our technology and the way that our teens are, uh, are, are growing. So it has to do with relationships. It has to do with this. Now, all of this, of course, is, I mean, I, I do everything that I can, but it's, it's for you guys. So what I want to segue into something that, uh, that, that is probably the R-rated portion of this, but I think that it's a natural reflection of the way that our brains are beginning to develop. So Barna released their pornography stats uh, two or three years ago. <coughs> okay, that Barna releases their pornography stats. Um, and they are horrifying. They are horrifying. All right? Now, this is where I, I mean, I, I just want to poke some holes in some things. One out of three Americans has seen porn. Okay? Statistically speaking. No? That would be three out of three, though, right? <laughs> uh, sorry, I, mean, I, I get I what you're saying. Nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. Okay, I got you. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm sure that there, there are levels. The point is, what's, what's the point of the, point of the study? It's prevalent. It's prevalent. All right, now, they do breakdowns of, of Christians versus non-Christians and everything like that, but there's one stat in their stats that as, I'm, as I read it when they released it, and then I read it again as I was getting ready to do this, and I was thinking about all the ways that the way we have crafted our relationships is making us, there's one stat that just blows my mind, and that's how basically the majority of people surveyed did not see anything wrong or any stigmas with pornography. It is no longer a stigmatized thing. 
That's what scares me because we are training our children to be raised in this dehumanizing relationship where their relationships even with their peers are robotic. So what's going to stop them from engaging in things that are devoid of all emotion? What's going to lead them? I mean, it is, it is increasingly going. And, you know, and Jeremy and I talked about it. We talked about, you know, and we were, we were the sort of guys that it was like, man, you had the trash bag in the back of the woods. And that's where you kept the magazines that your buddy Billy had that he stole from his dad. And like once a month, you'd go back there and you'd flip through them. And, and it was just, it was a horrifying feeling because you were just like, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. And it was this stigma. Right? It was this absolute stigma, everything about it. Or you'd go over to a friend's house, and they'd be like, hey, man, I got a video. And it was just kind of this whispered thing, and yet it was just very, very awkward. And now we all carry our addiction around in our pockets. I could not imagine being a teen the way I was now. I can't imagine doing that, just being perfectly honest. I, I, I just cannot fathom walking around with the fact that I have access to just everything that I could possibly want to have access to. And we're going to talk about some loopholes that they can get to it, even if you think that you have them blocked. Um, but there are ways, there are all these things, and it's just, to me, it's the growing nature that we are developing kids who don't know how to, don't have empathy, and they don't have, they, they're, they're lacking the ability with some of these relationships. And so porn is a natural extension of that, if you think about it. Porn is, is, is a natural extension of that. And so, yes, women and young ladies look at porn. Obviously, it's definitely more of a, of a, of a, male-centric, um, a male-centric thing. But to lighten it up, it's one of my favorite stories. Jessica wanted to buy. <laughs> Jessica wanted to buy. She wanted a, uh, an elliptical, right? And so we're at the house. This is, a, this is years ago. And Jessica wanted an elliptical. And she's like, hey, I'm going to price some ellipticals. And so she sits down on the computer, and she goes, oh, Dick's Sporting Goods has it, www.dicks.com. And I was on the other side of the house, and this is what I hear. No! No! And so I do what any human does, runs towards the screen, and so do our kids, and they run, and Jessica has both hands on the screen, so now she can't exit out. And she's like, get away! Get away! And of course, I am also like, what, what, what? And she's like, I'll tell you in a second. Get the kids, you know, take them to the backyard. Call your mom. Send them home. So we get them out, and she exits out. And I asked what she did, of course, and just so you know, it's dicksportinggoods.com. And she got her elliptical. Um, but, <laughs> all right, so, so that was just, that was just, that is such a great, such a great story. But let's let's walk let's walk through let's walk through a teenage a teenager's mind, the way that their brain is developing. First of all, um, what is pornography? Pornography. Your teens are developing. They're going through puberty. All right. So anything can be pornography if it is objectifying the object of that which they are looking at. Now we need to. We need to lay something out. It is totally normal for your 11, 12 to 14, 15 year old son to start liking butts. It is. That's normal. All right? And y'all are like, what? Yes, it's called puberty. It's called adolescence. It's part of it. One of the major problems we have in the church is we, we, we knee-jerk the second that our kid makes like a comment about, you know, hey, they were looking really like, they, they make a comment that's a little bit more than they were pretty, you know? And we knee-jerk and we're like, you need to shut that down. And we shame them. We shame them. And then so what they do is they start hiding this natural biological thing because we aren't being proactive about it. We're being reactive about it. All right, so again, let's paint, let's paint this, this picture. Your, your, your child has been given this phone, and I don't know, most of you all probably know how hashtags work. I can get on Instagram right now, go to the search bar, and find an obscure picture of whatever. If it has a hashtag, if it says hashtag butts, I can click on that hashtag and open up a world of butt pictures on Instagram, and you would never know it because it's not a search bar. You would never know it. And I could sit here and I could go as deep into Instagram as I wanted to 
clear it out, and you would have no clue that I just went on that fun hashtag journey because it's not a search bar, which, of course, you can clear histories on your search bar too. But my point is you can do that. Now, Instagram, Instagram does not have a uh, – it has a, a, uh, a policy. They're, they're not supposed to put blatant nudity on Instagram. Now, it pops up, and then they get rid of it, but they're not supposed to have it. But do you know what web protectors don't protect? Apps. They don't protect apps. We have a filter on the Gateway One. And now, sometimes I'm reticent to share this information because I don't want some of y'all to be like, score. Um, but those things protect you from hunting for things on the Internet. Do you know what they don't stop? You going onto your Twitter account, which does not have any laws or rules, and searching for whatever you want on Twitter. And so here in our church building with adult filtration systems, I can pull up pornography on my Twitter app because it doesn't stop apps. And Snapchat, it doesn't stop apps. So y'all might be like, what are, you, what are you saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying your parents, and this is for you guys to engage. This is your information to do with what you want. But I can tell you right now that what happens is is as they get involved with this sort of stuff at a young age, they begin to objectify at a young age, and like everything we've talked about, it slides into that whole idea of dehumanization, and it becomes part of their development. It imprints, because we are biologically supposed to connect with one person. We are created to be intimate with our spouse. We are created to engage in that way. And so when we act outside of creation, it's, it's sin. When we act outside of separation, we imprint on that, that which we were never intended to imprint upon. And so when our young people engage in pornography or any sort of dehumanization as part of their development, it creates imprints in their makeup that they will have to deal with potentially for the rest of their lives. Now, I'm going to continue. I'm going to, I'm going to really meddle now. I'm going to really meddle now because this is something that happens. So our teens engage online and they imprint on some of this stuff. And we have, let's say, and I'm going to use for this example, I'm going to use a young man because that's going to be probably where a lot of the issues are. Even though I have, I have dealt with some, some females that have had some issues with it as well, we, we tend to kind of turn a blind eye to that. But I'm going to use a guy. Let's say that we have this 13-year-old young man who has, struggled at home because he realized that a Google search can pull up whatever he wants to or he realizes that he can find some things that he wants to and then he comes to the place where we're not supposed to blur the lines and now stay with me and let me finish the conversation before your knives come out and he sees that girl in the youth group that he looks up to spiritually and let's say we're swimming and we don't have a dress code I don't create dress codes in youth ministry because I want girls to cover up. I create dress codes for everyone to cover up so we can train our young people and be proactive to not view each other as objects. Does that make sense? That's why I do that. And I know I have teens, I have people fight me on this all the time. And the truth of the matter is, is look, I hate, rape culture exists and I hate it. I will never look at a girl and say, you need to cover because you're making your brother in Christ sin. I will never say that to a girl. You know what I will say to a girl? Hey, you're a daughter of Christ and I would love for you to study what that means. And I would also love for you to understand that we are training here and we've got some people that aren't trained and if you could help me with that, that would be awesome. Because eventually, yes, we want to be in a place where our young men and our young ladies can look at each other without lust in their eyes because we have trained them to do so. But when they are of the age of 12 to 18, they have so much going on biologically, we need to be wise and create an environment in which we can proactively parent them through that. Are y'all feeling me on that? Is that, is that okay? That, so that's why I've been here, oh, I'm in my fourth year and I have, dress, I, have, I have a dress code. But, and if you're wondering, well, what is your dress code? Everyone wears shorts and, and a t-shirt. Everyone. Everyone. Because it is not, I will not reverse objectify anyone. Everyone wears shorts and a t-shirt. Why? It's so hot. The, the shirts chafe my nipples. I'm sorry, that's the one, that's the number one thing that I get from guys. <laughs> That's the number one thing that I get. I get so many guys, and they're just like, man, 
I can't. I just can't do it. And you know what I do? I tell them. I was like, it's deeper than just a rule. It's a kingdom thing where I'm trying to help you guys train your minds to come to a place where, yes, you can walk around in whatever you want to wear <laughs> and not look at someone else or, you know what I mean, eventually. Now, that might never happen because we're fallen and our brains work that way, so I'm not. But that's why, that's why we do that. We don't do that because it's a church and this is what you're supposed to do. We do that because we're saying we are a kingdom outpost and we are training our children to not dehumanize anybody. We are training our children to walk a path and we are training them in a culture where they are absolutely surrounded by dehumanization and as I've proven, even in their own friendships. So it's not just porn where they dehumanize, it's in their own relationships. So, what you guys want to do with all of this is completely up to you. That's what you want to do. Now, what she goes through in the book as far as, as she says, look, parents, Silence and solitude. Treat, allow your children to know that it's okay not to have that. You want to know the first way that you do that? What is it, parents? You put it down yourself. All right? Now, I struggle with this. I'm not hands-free at the house. I'm trying to be better. My kids will call me out. And I'll be like, they'll be like, hey, can I play on my phone? No. Well, you're playing on yours. And then what do I normally say? I normally go, I'm texting somebody from work. It's not, it doesn't matter. It's still, it's a defense mechanism for me to get my kid out. Oh, here's this one. How about this one? We don't want our kids to be bored, but we also don't want our kids to what? Annoy us. So what do we do? They walk in. Hey, can I play on the phone? No. They walk out. Five minutes later, they walk in. Can I play on the phone? No. They walk out. Five minutes later, they walk in. Can I play on the phone? Yes! Yes! You can play on the phone! And you send them out, and they play on the phone. Now, I was talking. My parents used to do the same thing with me. They got annoyed with me all the time. I, I'm not surprised. Um, they got annoyed with me all the time. But there was a small difference. You know what it was? It wasn't go play on the phone. It was go outside. It was go do something. And so our brains did engage in a way. So even when our parents were righteously annoyed with us, we were still learning how to activate parts of our mind that we're, we need to push our, our teens. We do. But as we've shown, are we unintentionally depriving them of some things by doing that? So what I would say, and you're absolutely right. Again, I'm not telling you guys to send your kids outside. I'm saying figure out the principle. Is because we feel the phone is safer, which I think we've proven in a lot of ways it's not. So what is the in-between? Maybe, I'll talk to myself on this. Maybe, Seth, what you're doing is as important as what you could be doing with your kid. Now that's, that's me. I'm going to say that right now. I, I, I am an inherently selfish person. I, I am. And, I, and there are so many times that I think that I could, could fix my kid's boredom by simply stopping what I want to do in that exact moment. So maybe the issue is I have my own addictions that I need to deal with um, to, to fix that. And we have to exercise wisdom. That's why I'm I'm throwing out the information. I guess I'm glad you brought that up, Jeremy, and, and the fears are very founded because what I wanted to do is say that maybe it's not safe to give them the phone. You know what I mean? So maybe, especially with, with, with you know, the way that we're engaged like that. So she says, teach them. Put your phone down. Teach them that it's okay to be quiet. And it's okay, not like quiet because that's not going to work, but like silence and solitude. These are our spiritual disciplines. We are called to this as followers of Jesus. To stop. I mean, in Matthew 6, when it says, don't go pray out in the street, pray in your closet, it's not saying be private in your prayer. It's saying carve out swaths of your day and have silence in the presence of God. This is scriptural. This is, this is, this is what God has called us to do. We need to teach our kids this. One of the main reasons I do retreats, and one of the reasons I do the retreat the way I do it in the fall, is because we have our kids so stinking busy that they are just balls of stress and anxiety. And on top of that, everything we talked about, the stress we don't even know we're causing them subconsciously because they're constantly tethered to their friends. There's a great interview in here with a, a girlfriend who is just absolutely hate doesn't even like dating anymore because she says, I'm never not with my boyfriend. She's like, we hang out, we go on a date, and then we're constantly texting each other. And she's like, I don't like it. I don't like it. And so she's like, I don't even want to date anymore because of that. So these things exist. Yes, right. 
Oh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on that too. There's a lot of things. That's why I want to do this bi-yearly so we can continue to expand some of these things. Um, so I'm going to fly. So table. Sit at the table with your kids. Find time to do that. Sans phones. You teach them. In fact, what she says is that family conversation, we forget that family conversations is what trains them to have empathy and how to have conversations. And I've tried to do, be better. I tend to be quick with my kids. I do. I tend to, to not want to engage them in full-on conversations because I myself am struggling with a lot of this stuff. So this is a way that we can be proactive. So two more things real quick, and they're not related to anything, so they're wild tangents, but that's just how it's going to be. One, on the way back to the dehumanization on the pornography thing that I wanted to talk about real quick. An article came out, a study came out two years ago, and this study, oh my goodness, youth ministers just lost their junk when this came out. But they interviewed like this, this thousands of young women across the country, high school students, and they were talking about the way that the non-stigmatized theme of pornography and the fact that pornography is so easily accessible and very accessible and accessed. I have talked, all right, I'm going to make some of you uncomfortable. I've talked with your teens about this and they have been previewed to or have been around someone who has talked about seeing pornography. Now, I don't have this in class conversations because I want to protect your choice to have whatever innocence you want to have with your child, but I have teens that will come up to me and say it or ask the question, and some of them said, yeah, in the, in the locker room, it is not uncommon for them to see. The point is, is it happens everywhere because we, give, we throw these things at our kids and we're like, have fun, don't search anything bad. <laughs> and then we move on, and we forget, again, hopefully what I've shown you all is the onion layers of how deep this, this, this psychology goes. Now, here was what the study said. Here was what the study said. Thousands of girls, and this is, this is, this is big for you, you, you parents of boys in particular. But the prevalence of the unstigmatized pornography and the way that they were looking, it meant that that was what, and we've always said this was a problem with porn, but now it's really starting to manifest, is that becomes the boy's expectation of what relationships are. That becomes there, and it becomes everybody's, but it becomes now. Again, that is something that has existed. Well, now it's existing in high schoolers to the point that thousands of girls were like, yeah, this guy was like, hey, I'll date you if you give me a blowjob. I'll date you if you let me do this to you. I will date you if, and all of a sudden these become the ways that they have seen this as normal. They have seen it because they are so inundated because we as parents have been like, we, I mean, I'm sorry. It's like, yes, trust your kids, but also don't trust them because they're biologically developing. Their brains are mush and they need you to guide them. Yes. yes. Well, now, now let's, but I am going to flip it a little bit. So how do the young ladies do this? Well, young ladies want validation and they want likes really, 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 really bad. And they realize, hey, if I post this picture of me and I kind of have, you know, a look about me, I find that I get a little bit more of that fake happiness happening. You know what I mean? And they start, sometimes they wrap their minds around, again, this idea that, well, I want to be loved I want to, and I am getting positive attention. The neuro, and then they don't say this, but the neurotransmitters in my brain are firing and telling me this is good because people like you. Identity issues. So that's how it becomes there. So you have a guy who's become overwashed with some of this situation, and then you have a girl who's like having identity issues, and all of her happiness is tied up into all of the validation that she can receive on social media. And then also, again, you have just the cruelty of the relationships that can exist, the lack of empathy. All of these things happen that begin to slowly create us. We are all the cyborgs now. We are all the sterilized, dehumanized things. And then, yeah, Jessica brought up a good point, and this one is interesting. Um, uh, the, the other thing with the cell phones that it creates is, is it messes with our, with our minds because when my parents sent me on a youth trip, they kissed me and they were like, have fun. I'll see you on Saturday. And then I was gone. And they did not see me until Saturday. And if there was an emergency, they called the youth minister. Now, we all want our kids to text us back immediately. Yeah. We, we go, they show up. And they don't send us a text, and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, this is like a Red Dawn situation. Russia has come. <laughs> and they showed up at impact. We, we always immediately think the worst when we can't get a hold of our scene. So now we are now creating a 
attachment issue. And so our kids, when they're in high school, they hate it. And they're like, oh, I can't stand it. And it was so funny. Impact used to have a rule, you can't have a cell phone. You want to know why they got rid of that rule? Because of you guys. They got rid of that rule because parents were complaining that their children weren't texting them when they were in Bible class because they weren't supposed to have their phones with them. I sat down with a girl at Impact, and she was distraught. And I was like, what happened? What's going on? She wasn't in our youth group. She's like, oh, my mom is freaking out. And I was like, why? And she's like, well, I texted her this morning. I was like, hey, mom, I'm here. Here's the schedule. Here's what I'm doing. I'm going to be in class. And when I got back to my room, I had like 47,000 missed text messages while I was at class because she was freaking out that I wasn't responding to her text messages, even though I told her. She was visibly upset about that. She was visibly upset. So what we do, now here's how it works. Now, I'm not telling you to stop getting up with your kids. It does cause some problems. Here's the problem it caused. Your kid shows up, they have a little run-in with somebody else, okay? Those things happen, and they can't always happen in my view. There's 50 people there, I can't always watch them. That happens. Well, instead, it doesn't really resolve itself really well. It's, and so what they do is they text parents. Now parents kind of like, oh, what is going on? Well, then all of a sudden, my phone starts blowing up. Do you know that there's a murder in the other cabin? And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I walk over there, and it turns out that it's nothing, and they had already resolved it. But what does the teen forget to do? text the parent that it was all resolved because they were so mad when they texted the parent before. This is a reality. It's not that bad here. It has happened here before, but it's not that bad. But what, all right, here's how that works. I'm sorry, I'm going a little over time. I'll let you go. Here's how that works. They hate it in high school, and then they go off to college. And they realize, hey, I kind of liked having that tetheredness. And psychologically, adolescence now extends. Are you all ready for this? Adolescence now extends to the age of 26 years old. And the last in the last decade, it has gone from 21, 22 to 26 years old is the new end of adolescence. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're constantly tethered, all the instant gratification that comes from this, other psychological things like the fact that our kids are the most entitled group of people of all time, um, which is probably something we'll talk about next time. But adolescence now extends to 26 because of that tethering which speaks into the fact of we do have to trust our kids a little bit. But I'm not going to tell you all how to do that because I'm still figuring it out myself. But we are in this to a degree together. We're all in this room and we're all doing this. Yes? I, I had to step out for a minute to do something with the audio, but did you mention the Snapchat I, I've not gone into Snapchat too much, and I'll tell you why. I'm scared of you guys because most of your kids have Snapchat. Um, uh, no, no, I'll do it. I don't mind. I, I, I personally, and this, again, I am not telling you how to parent. I'm not telling you how to parent. Our kids' number one social media interaction is Snapchat. Our kids, not only is it pretty much the number one now across the board, it is most certainly the number one in our youth group. Not only is it number one in the way that they use it, but they use the messaging system on it too. They don't really text each other all that much anymore. Now, I'm, how many of y'all just don't know the origins of Snapchat? Okay, all right, but most of you do. Um, Snapchat was at its very core. You could send a picture to somebody, and within 10 seconds it deleted off their phone, and there was no record of what you sent them. It was created as a sexting device. It was created as a sexting device. It is on record that it was created as a sexting device. So, again, y'all that are cringing right now, I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm, I'm observing, okay? It was created as that. Now, it has expanded and it's created the story features and all of these features which I will openly admit I think that they're really cool I do but there's still the basis that Snapchat is unsearchable and it deletes now I had Snapchat when it first came out and I was a youth minister in Tennessee and I did like what 99% of the teens do with it I was making silly faces taking selfies and I was snapping them to people well a teen comes to church the next day and she's like yeah I got in trouble last night with my mom I was like oh yeah what happened she's like well she walked in and she's like you're supposed to be doing homework and I said I'm snapping my youth minister right now and she goes oh what are y'all snapchatting each other and I went there's no way she could ever know. And I deleted the app when she told me the story in real time. Immediately went to her parent and said, hey, I was, Jessica was snapping her that night too. I was like, we were sending her really silly pictures of our face. I've deleted the app and I'm not going to use it anymore. That's why I don't have a Snapchat. Because if you guys are ever worried about your child and my relationship with them, you can always come to me and I can show you our interactions. 
I very rarely meet with any of them one on one. I don't, I don't meet with females one on one because uh, Jessica goes with me, but I've actually started developing it to where I don't even meet with a lot of males one on one. I do some, but even, even then. And, and again, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't like living by that, but that's just how it is because I want you guys to be able to walk up hey, what were you texting him? What did you say to him? What have you emailed her? What have you done? And I can, and if they're like, no, I don't want you to see, and they delete it, you can come to me and I will show you. Um, and by the way, even when I'm counseling them and they are asking me about things they haven't told you yet, I want you all to know I always counsel them to eventually get to you. Always. Always. On everything. Even things that they have resolved, I still counsel them to get to you because ultimately that's the relationship they need to have with you all. I do that. Um, so, that's why I don't have a Snapchat. We actually have a Gateway Student Ministry Snapchat that is run by Christian Folk and uh, Tate Hendricks. I, again, I'm going to be proactive. They all use it. It's a communication tool. I'm going to try to redeem it. How you choose to use it is completely up to you. I do not, I want to make something very clear. I've never had this conversation with the teens in a class setting. I've, they, if they come up to me one-on-one, -on -one, hey, man, why don't you have Snapchat? Hey, I just... I like to have accountability. It's just something that's important to me. It's important to my wife. It's important to the elders. It's important to Jeremy. I don't have it for that reason. That's it. I do not shame your children. I promise. I, that's not true. I do shame them, but normally playfully. I do not shame them for that. Um, funnels into proactive, Jesus-based kingdom parenting and us being in this together. Here's the, the, end, the end game is this. Everything we've talked about tonight has psychological ramifications with the development of your child. Take it seriously and work with it how you want to. Choose to be proactive. Choose to how you want to do it, but know that it's, this is no longer a phase. Oh, it's just a phase that they're in. No, it's not. It's going to imprint on them in various ways, and it's going to do it. It's going to, and I am, I am watching it in real time. Youth ministers are watching it in real time. Teens are different than they used to be. In a lot of ways, there's a lot of neat things about it, but there's a lot of things that we find really challenging about it. Um, and, it and a lot of it has to do with the fact that everything that I've laid out here uh, tonight. And we can talk about this stuff, and we can be open with this stuff, and we can say, hey, I am struggling with this, or I am doing this, or I can, um, you know, what are some ways that we can be more proactive as parents with our kids? Um, and, and like I said, like Kevin said, how can we work this in the youth ministry to where we're creating an environment where we are training them and being proactive with them, not blurring the lines of what the world wants them to do, but really creating something that is different and radical and crazy and all of us partnering together to lead our children to know, to really love Jesus. I mean, really not love Him like I'm going to go to church on Sunday morning, to just be so enamored with Him that they eventually do what I want my kids to do and that's make the choice to follow Him for the rest of their life and to not let the things of the world get in and cloud them. Um, so, right. Let's say a prayer. Father God, we love you so much, and we love the way that you've blessed us. And Father, like, like we said at the beginning, you sent your son to save us. You didn't send your son to parent our children. That's the task that you've given us. And Father, so for the people in this room, our purpose is to raise the souls of our children to know and to love you. Our purpose is is to not let our own selfish idols and our own selfish addictions and the things that we struggle with get in the way to where we look for easy fixes and things like that. Father, I pray that as we navigate what culture is, all the things that are going on in culture and all the things that are just constantly bombarding our children through their phones, but just through what they're seeing just across the board and, and just all this darkness and futility, that we can always be a place that is a lighthouse to them at this church and in our homes. That it can be a safe sanctuary, Father, but not a sanctuary that where we separate them from the world, but where we bring them in and we train them and we're proactive and we love them so much that they're able to go out into the world taking that light with them. And Father, that is a challenge. It's a challenge in so many ways, Father. It's a challenge because a lot of us in this room parent differently and we already feel a little bit uncomfortable because we know the person sitting across the room does things differently than us. Father, that's of the devil and that is divisive 
because it is divisive in the sense that what he wants to do is put us against each other. We are all in this together. We can have different forms of parenting and still be in your name. Father, let us not have to keep justifying ourselves to each other. Let's walk with each other. Father, let's not, let's not let those seeds of division and defensiveness and judgmentalism creep into our hearts in this room. And so, Father, there's, there's a lot of things that we, we, we brushed on, um, but I pray mostly for the souls and the hearts of our teenagers, Father. And I've, I've been really hard on them tonight, and that's probably not fair, but I think that we have to speak honestly sometimes, Father. The teens in this room are my... Uh, the teens whose, whose parents are in this room, they're, they're my world. They are, my, they are very much my life, Father, and I, and, I, and I am so blessed to be partnered with them. And so I, I hope that this came across not as an attack, not as anything like that, but just some observations that I've made. And Father, if anything that I said, as, I, as, I, as I've, I've been putting to you here lately, if anything I said is not of your spirit, if anything I said is, is not of... What, what you wanted people to hear, I, I pray that those words are forgotten right now. They're forgotten right now. They fall to the floor useless. But I pray that there were things that were said, whether you wanted them to be, that whether they came from my mouth or not, but the way people heard them, that their hearts were open to hear them. We love you so much. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.